We think it's safe to say that everyone enjoys a good mystery. The act of unraveling an intriguing puzzle or deciphering the meaning behind a certain event holds an air of mystique within most human minds. Enter the ARG, or alternate reality game. Now this isn't going to be an in-depth tutorial on the inner mechanics of how this method of storytelling works. There are plenty of other videos covering that very topic. What we're here to do is shed light on just one of these particular stories. How is everyone? And welcome to Penalty of Death Productions' very first look at arguably one of the frontrunners of alternate reality storytelling. At least as far as YouTube is concerned. We're of course talking about the mystery thriller known simply as Lonely Girl 15. Now we here at Penalty of Death hold an endearing sentiment for this groundbreaking web series as it was many of our introductions into this unique and innovative form of media. Many of our members absolutely fell in love with the concept of ARGs, due in large part to this internet saga. The premise alone captured our imaginations to such a degree that for many years afterwards some of us even considered traditional film and television to be outdated and that this was indeed the new wave of the future. Now it's a concept that I'm happy to say that we've walked back on, but that doesn't mean that our love for the ARG has diminished in any way. Lonely Girl 15 lit the flames of inspiration in us with such an amount of fervor that nearly two decades later we endeavored to create our very own fictional foray with the creation of our flagship mockumentary, The Warrensdale Mystery, which we hope to expand into its own full-fledged universe with uh, lore, history, with rich protagonists and antagonists. We hope to bring you this universe by way of sequels, web series, and other social rabbit trails. And no matter how many other great ARGs and stories are added to the creative melee of YouTube, things like Marble Hornets, Meet Sleep, and of course, Dad, for us, it will always begin with Lonely Girl 15. Now imagine our shock and bewilderment to find that just by a simple search, discovering that there all are almost no explanation videos that exist to flesh out the story, the characters, or the themes of this wonderful experience. Not one prominent creator, that we could find anyway, has endeavored to do an in-depth analysis on the Lonely Girl 15 saga. Well, we're here to change all that. To give one of the granddaddies of alternate storytelling the spotlight and reverence it deserves. But before we begin, we will give credit where credit is due. In our research for this analysis series, we did come across some great YouTubers who covered the origin and behind the scenes of LG15. Videos that, might we add, greatly aided us in the writing of this Explained Season 1. We'd like to give a special shout out to the channels of Soft Lavender. Internet AJ and Quentin Reviews for their awesome behind the scenes content. Links to their analysis videos will be in the description. And now, without further ado, Penalty of Death Productions is proud to present to you Lonely Girl 15, Season 1. Explained. Enjoy. This is Brie Avery, a shy and somewhat introverted 16-year-old girl vlogging from her bedroom to what will become a captive audience. In the early days of YouTube, vlogging had become a novel concept, with the idea of watching a random person just sitting in front of a camera and spouting off details about their everyday life becoming very popular indeed. At first, Brie seemed to be no different than dozens of others who were taking to YouTube. But there seemed to be something different about Brie, a childlike innocence and charming type of insecurity that resonated with many people. Little do we know that the video entitled First Blog, Dorkiness Prevails, would catapult audiences into a thrilling, creepy, and mysterious saga that would have viewers questioning what was real and what wasn't. For her first few videos, we see Brie musing about typical teen angst, introducing us to her room and various stuffed animals, with one notable standout, that being of Purple Monkey, a hand puppet that would come to symbolize Brie's lost innocence. 
In the video entitled The Daniel Beast, we are introduced to our second main character, Bree's friend Daniel. Daniel is an 18-year-old former classmate and seems to be somewhat awkward himself. It's explained that Daniel helped Bree set up her webcam as well as help edit her various videos. In the next several uploads, we see Bree and Daniel messing about as well as the former hinting that her parents are quite strict and severely restrict what activities the 16-year-old gets involved in. A few uploads later, and we find out that apparently Bree's father took Daniel aside to speak to him about something. A conversation in which Bree is very interested in. What did my dad ask you? No. Yes, he did ask you something. No, not really. Something, tell me. Why? He didn't really ask anything. Daniel's a liar. On his own channel, Daniel explains the exchange that he had with Bree's father. To be honest with you, it's kind of irritating. So, her dad invited me back to the summer camp. It sucks. It's so weird. Bree's really into it. She's like a counselor. She's been a counselor now for a couple of years, I think. I haven't really been to too many summer camps, but I'm guessing sports summer camps, you know, you learn about sports. This one, they learn about their religion. He invited me because he wants me to film this little play they do at the end of the year, which is not what I want to do. I didn't really want to, and that's when her dad's all. Well, maybe we can't have you coming over anymore. Giving him all the excuses possible that I can to get out of it, because it's lame. Responding to Daniel's video, Bree lightly admonishes her friend for making her unnamed religion and his experience at the summer camp sound weird, and that he was misunderstanding her parents' intentions. Afterwards, Bree invites Daniel over to talk things out, but end up having a heated argument over Bree's religion, driving a wedge in between the two. It's at this point that the series takes on one of many tonal shifts. Beforehand, everything had been lighthearted, documenting the lives of two shy and introverted teenagers who shared a unique friendship. However, with this upload, we see that all may not be well and that Bree's mysterious religion may have darker undertones than previously thought. Bree then records a vlog revealing that she was born in the United States but moved to New Zealand at the age of eight. While there, she lived in some sort of commune, after which her parents remove her from public school. After moving to Australia, she witnesses an unnerving event with her father, that of a thunderous and unnatural looking rainstorm which seared itself into her memory. When she was 12, the family moved to England for two years and subsequently moved back to the US shortly thereafter. Having not reconciled from their argument, Daniel decides to attend the summer camp play after all, but wants to make it a surprise for Bree. As you already know, Daniel came to my summer camp play last night, and I was really, 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 really excited. The whole night I was trying not to look at anyone in the crowd because I thought it would throw me off. Then, towards the end, I hadn't flipped a single line, and I got to this part where my character was having an argument with her teacher, and just to the right of his head, about six rows back, I saw Daniel smiling at me, and I completely forgot my line. It's probably the nicest thing that anybody's ever done for me, <laughs> including my parents. Anyway, after the play, I had to stay and change out of my costume and talk to my parents' friends and stuff. And Daniel waited for me for a whole hour. It was really nice. With their feud being settled, Bree and Daniel go on a day excursion of hiking and swimming. Whilst having fun, Bree begins to question Daniel about one of his classmates, a girl named Cassie. However, Daniel seems puzzled as he claims to know nothing of Cassie. It's notable that at this point, the intense scrutiny centered around the series came to a head as several sleuths out the web series as entirely fictional. The world at large now knew that Lonely Girl 15 was indeed a fake. Lonely Girl 15 is a video vlog that started in 2006. It was basically about a young girl named Bree and her best friend Daniel. What you need to know about my town is that it's really boring. Like, really. 
really boring. That's probably why I spend so much time on my computer. People believe that it was real, but it was in fact staged and uh, yeah. improvised. There were these two guys, uh, Miles and Mesh, and they came up with this idea for a way to tell a story. So they were gonna set us up as these two characters and we we're gonna disappear and six months to a year later a movie would come out. But we got outed by the New York Times. Next thing you know, a brand new type of series was born. But this didn't spell doom for the fledgling series, quite the opposite. Audiences seemed even more intrigued and the fan base seemed to grow as a result. Brie, now revealed to be the talented actress Jessica Lee Rose, had crafted a unique character which enthralled us with her innocence and charm, while at the same time fooling many into believing the well-crafted narrative to this point. But what many didn't know was that LG-15 was just getting started. Back in the world of Lonely Girl 15, Brie reveals more about her mysterious religion and an ominous upcoming event. Okay, so most of you already know that I'm religious. The reason that I don't talk about my beliefs is I take them very seriously. And I think that if I were to tell you about them, that some of you would be very disrespectful. Not all of you, but some of you. So today I got some really cool news from my parents. I've been chosen to participate in a ceremony the ceremony is a really big deal in my religion. They only have them once in a really long while, and it's very, very difficult to attend. My parents won't even be allowed to come. It's a big honor, and it's going to take a lot of preparation. There's a bunch of stuff that I'm going to have to memorize. And I'm really bad at memorizing, so that should be fun. There's also going to be some special exercises that I have to learn. I don't really know how they work, but my mom said she would help me with them. I'll have to go on a diet. This I'm definitely not looking forward to. Other than that, it's basically like preparing for a bar mitzvah or a confirmation. So yeah. In one of her Proving Science Wrong videos, Brie reveals that she was bullied in public school as a child. Daniel then responds with his own video, telling the viewers that it's at this time when he and Brie first met. He wants to take Brie to a party in which he knows many of her old classmates will be in attendance. Having watched his video, Brie then persists to ask her parents permission, which they flatly deny. In her following video, we see what Brie intends to do about her social predicament. Okay, I'm gonna talk kinda quiet because I decided to go to that party with Daniel. In about an hour, Daniel's gonna be here. I told him to park on the street and then call once and hang up. I'm gonna climb out that window. Don't worry, it's really easy. There's a tree and I'm an excellent climber. And then Daniel's gonna take me to the party. The only thing is, I've never done anything against my dad's wishes. And I kind of feel like the sky's gonna fall on my head. In the follow-up, Brie tells us that her parents had caught her sneaking back into the house after she had attended the party with Daniel and that she was subsequently grounded. At the party, she meets a couple named Andrea and Paul and that the duo had asked her and Daniel to hang out with them again. Brie states her intentions to disobey her parents yet again and sneak out the very next night in order to spend time with Daniel and her new friends. In this video, we see Bree's burgeoning independent nature. Now, whether this is just due to Daniel's influence or normal teen rebellion can be debated. The very next night, we see Daniel waiting to pick Bree up for a night of bowling. Daniel then reveals that he's been banned from the house by Bree's father, but he doesn't seem to care. He is determined to spend more time with his friend. During the course of the video, it is implied that Brie is being forced to take a regimen of supplements and iron pills in her ongoing preparation for her mysterious ceremony. The next morning before Daniel gives her a driving lesson, Brie admits that he had kissed her at the party and that she didn't know quite what to think about it. During the driving lesson, tensions rise and the pair get into yet another argument. The subject of Bree's religion gets brought up and it's here where the audience will hear a name that will come to be the attached moniker of this ominous organization for the rest of the series. Namely, The Order. 
In the next upload, Bree tells us that she intends to blow off plans she has with Daniel in order to attend the fall equinox celebration with her parents. She also divulges that her studies for the mysterious upcoming ceremony involve learning an ancient language spoken by very few. In order to learn this language, she studies by making flashcards held up by her stuffed animals, and it's here that we see various symbols that resemble hieroglyphs. Daniel doesn't take too well to Bree blowing him off and asks her to meet him at the park to talk it out. After the meeting, Bree tells us what happened. Okay, so... I have completely alienated my only friend. I snuck out again and I met Daniel in the park just like he asked and he didn't even give me a chance to explain. He just started yelling at me. I told him that I was sorry and that I never meant to hurt him but going with my parents is really important especially since they're not going to be at the ceremony. And he flipped out. He said that my religion was getting in the way of... Or whatever it is. And he told me that I had to choose between him or my religion. There's no choice. I've been religious my whole life and I've known Daniel for two years. I was so upset when I got home that my parents knew that I'd snuck out. I told them everything. They said that I had violated my purity bond and that I shouldn't be allowed to do the ceremony. I don't think that I'll ever talk to Daniel again. <laughs> now I've got to completely focus on my preparations. I don't want to let my parents down. After getting the news of Bree's decision, Daniel decides to head to her house and sees Bree with an unknown woman. In her next video, Brie explains that the woman she was seen with is what she calls her new helper, a person recommended to her by her parents. Apparently, the woman's name is Lucy and her function is akin to a counselor of sorts. Brie lets us know that she plans to further distance herself from Daniel and hopes to build a new relationship with Lucy as her new counselor will also be attending the mysterious ceremony. Next, we delve a little further into Bree's past as she reveals just how her parents met each other. Okay, so I thought I'd tell you a story about my parents. When my dad was 23, he got a fellowship to study medicine at the University of Oxford. My mom, who was two years younger, was studying in Edinburgh, which is in Scotland. So my mom used to take the train down to London on the long weekends because she was doing her dissertation on Johann Weyer. She would study at the British Museum and sometimes go and see plays. One day, she went to see Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, which is about two small characters in Hamlet, but in this play, they're the main characters. I know this is complicated, but bear with me, it's pretty much the coolest story ever. So when the intermission came, my mom went out to the lobby and she overheard these two boys arguing. They were arguing about free will versus determinism, which is apparently the theme of the play. They were just trying to sound smart. One of the boys was saying that because the two characters die in the end of Hamlet, that nothing they do matters. That was my dad. My mom listened for a few minutes and decided that pretty much everything my dad was saying was wrong. So she thought it was time to open up a good old fashioned can of whoop. So she tapped him on the shoulder and she said that the message of the play was that these sad little characters spent their lives arguing about the inevitability of their fate instead of actually doing something about it. And she said that if these boys didn't watch out, they would be just like them. 
My dad was smitten. Like a kitten. Daniel, still not content to stay away, once again follows her and the mysterious Lucy as they drive to what seems to be a business park in the center of town. He speculates this may have something to do with the upcoming ceremony. After Daniel's last video, Bree relates that she is furious with him for continuing to follow her. The audience learns that it was Daniel who first approached Bree at school because he noticed she had no friends. Thus began their burgeoning relationship. In the video, she lets Daniel know that she wants to go through with the ceremony and that in the end, it is truly her choice. In the next few uploads, Daniel relays of how he is starting to believe Bree's religious order is indeed some kind of a cult and that he has researched a name that Bree has uttered more than once. Dendera. Daniel finds out that Dendera refers to an ancient Egyptian temple located to the north of the city of Luxor, and indeed the bizarre language Bree was learning in preparation for her ceremony is known as the Anakian alphabet. This language has its roots with the 16th century mystics John Dee and Edward Kelly. Dee and Kelly claimed that they had spent years recording and deciphering the language during seances, or as they describe it, scrying sessions they held with so-called angels. The symbols and glyphs they transcribed would later be named the Anakian text by several prominent occultists. The name derives from the biblical prophet of Enoch, who is said to have gained otherworldly and some say forbidden knowledge from both angelic and demonic entities. Bree later explains that the order specifically adheres to what is called the Zodiac of Dendera. She hints that the order may have started with a contingent of Napoleon's troops who first entered the temple back in 1799. A Parisian artist made sketches of the Zodiac that was carved directly into the temple rooftop after which he sends them back to Paris. The sketches created a stir amongst the upper crust of the French elite, and that back in 1820, an engineer by the name of jean Lee Lorraine was sent back to Dendera to remove the original Zodiac and replace it with a convincing forgery. The Zodiac itself contained 36 deacons, which correlate to the original 36 constellations. Each deacon rises above the horizon for a period of 10 days every year. The Dendera Zodiac is at odds with the regular Zodiac because the Dendera variation contains 10 days within its week instead of the normal 7. In tradition, the Dendera variation is supported by four priestesses under what is called the Canopy of Heaven. In opposition, there is an earth spirit named Gem who supports all other portions of the canopy. Next, we hear from Daniel and his further research into the cult of Dendera. Some things Bree said in her last video got me thinking, and I've been doing research. First up, Dendera. So, it turns out the temple she's talking about is a temple to Hathor. Hathor was the goddess of all women, no matter their station in life. She was a goddess of fertility, and she was associated with the flooding of the Nile. She was a goddess of joy, motherhood, love. Oh, this is getting me nowhere. I googled Aleister Crowley and Hathor together. Crowley translated Hathor to mean mother of light. He considered her to be both sun and moon goddess and honored her so much that he named one of his tarot cards after her. This gets really weird. It's Crowley. Hathor represented the sun in the passage from east to west through the sky. It goes on to describe a ritual that he designed to honor her. The person was to walk in a straight line stopping to face the east at one end and then walk back the way they had come and stopped to face the west. When we hear from Bree next, she announces her excitement as her ceremony is only a day away. We learn that in addition to a strict diet, including supplements of iron pills, she has also been receiving injections of an unknown substance that leave her weak and disoriented. Bree also comments that her studies into the Anakian texts have intensified and that she thinks it's quite a beautiful language. 
Bree has also come to the realization that her ties with Daniel have to be severed in accordance with the order. Again, we find Daniel tailing Bree and Lucy after they leave the house. Trying to stay inconspicuous, he lags behind as not to be noticed. I couldn't have to park up the road, but that's gotta be that. Who is that guy? I hope he knows what she's doing. This is ridiculous. somebody in the bushes and I just took off. I gotta get out of here. I gotta go. So I wasn't gonna talk about this today because I thought I'd be too weak, but I feel great. The ceremony was amazing. I feel so close to the people that I love now. I mean, even though my parents weren't there, I, I definitely felt their presence. Lucy was incredible. She stood beside me the entire time and, and held my hand. I got to meet many of the elders. I've been told that it's a huge honor just to be in their presence. Now I understand why. I didn't slip up once. I remembered all of the steps that Lucy and I had worked on. I remembered my Enochian symbols, all of them. So that was cool. It was pretty amazing studying all these things for months and then seeing them all used in one night. The language, the steps, the discipline. There was an incantation given at the end of the ceremony that was in Enochian, and I actually understood most of it. So, I guess I'm kind of sad now because it's over. I won't be seeing Lucy anymore. She's being sent somewhere else, but I made a promise to keep in touch. One thing that I was told after the ceremony is that now I'm in a place of much greater responsibility. It's going to be more important than ever to stay disciplined. I don't think it's going to be a problem though, because I feel like a completely new person. Daniel then comments that in Bree's last video, she still has bandaging on her arm. Now if the ceremony was indeed over, then why would it be necessary for her to still be getting injections? He also notes that her euphoria seems fake and forced. Daniel then takes it upon himself to continue and follow Lucy as he doesn't trust what's going on. He follows the woman to what seems to be her residence. He breaks in and upon inspecting a desktop computer is horrified to discover that Lucy herself and others associated with the order have indeed been following him. Contained in one of the folders on the desktop are several pictures of himself taken outside the grounds where Bree's ceremony took place. The pictures depict him hiding behind bushes and trees spying on the proceedings. Panicked that the order is now onto him, he bolts out of Lucy's apartment. 
Bree then makes a video both chiding Daniel and warning him that he's playing a very dangerous game with the order. She scolds him for breaking into Lucy's apartment and that he once again violated her trust by spying on the ceremony. She does admit, however, that she doesn't know why the order would be following him and that she has no knowledge of the pictures the operatives took of him outside the ceremony. Bree then makes a vow to try and find out what is going on and pleads with Daniel to lay low. We are now introduced to the character of Gemma. Gemma is from the UK and in her response video she states that she's new to YouTube but has been keeping up with Bree's videos. She states that her and Bree actually go way back and that she hopes Bree remembers her. She reminisces about when Bree used to play with Gemma's dog. Gemma then explains that her and her parents still live in the community as she calls it. Now it's heavily implied that Gemma has also grown up in a religious commune very similar to Bree. One we can assume is another branch of the Order. The Order now seems to be a worldwide organization with vast resources and contacts. Gemma states that she sympathizes with Bree's plight of not letting outsiders in. For her next upload, Bree states that she's worried about Daniel as he's not answering any of her texts or phone calls. Every time she calls his house, his parents just nonchalantly tell her that he's staying with friends and that they don't know when he'll be back. She once again chides Daniel for bringing this all on himself by continuing to goad the order with his videos and his relentless habit of sticking his nose where it didn't belong. A few days later, we learn of Daniel's exact whereabouts. So, I'm outside of my friend's place right now. After I found those pictures of me on Lucy's computer, I kind of freaked out. I asked my friend if I could crash here for a little while. The cult's been following me. I know that for sure. I, I don't know for how long, maybe a long time. There's still a lot of things that don't fit together. I know the reason is a secret of cult, but I don't think your parents know everything that's going on. They're nice people. I think if they knew about this stuff, they'd be afraid for their daughter. I don't know why they trust this Lucy person. I followed her from Bree's house. I know they're still meeting. Why are they still meeting if the ceremony's over? And those photographs, Bree, why'd they take pictures of me? I know it was crazy of me to break into Lucy's apartment, but I didn't know what else to do. I was really worried for you. Now work for both of us. I'll contact you when I can. Gemma uploads another video talking a little bit about her life in London. She also relates that her mother and Bree's mother were good friends and how they met during a philosophy class in Edinburgh. Bree's mother seems to be well respected in what she continues to call the community, what we can assume to be none other than the order. When we next hear from Bree, she makes a shocking revelation. I just got off the phone with Daniel. I feel terrible. I lied to him. I lied to him like there was no ceremony the other night. What he filmed was a fake, a setup. The people that were preparing me for the ritual, they found out that he'd been filming us. They told me to lie and pretend that the ceremony was the other night so that Daniel would try and follow us. I don't know why they took pictures of him. Daniel, I swear, I don't know. They're making me continue to prepare and to get these shots and Lucy comes over and we walk through the rituals every day, but she still won't tell me anything. I guess that trust is pretty important in these ceremonies. Maybe this is some sort of test, I don't know. They won't even tell me when the ceremony is. I'm confused, I just, I don't know what to do. When Daniel called, he said that I shouldn't go through with the ceremony because I didn't know enough. I don't know, I'm starting to feel like maybe he's right. Why would they take pictures of him? That really, me out. 
Anyway, I'm gonna meet Daniel later. We're gonna try and figure this all out. Here we see an interesting shift in Bree. From once being totally trusting of her environment to questioning her purpose and that those whom she once regarded as her caretakers who had wisdom of what was best for her to adopting a more suspicious nature. This can be seen as a major turning point in her character. From loyal, trusting, and yes, indoctrinated, leading to her mental breaking of everything she's ever known up until that point. Next we see Bree has reunited with Daniel and that she has come to a major decision. She is not going to go through with the actual ceremony and that she is going to confide in her parents about everything that has happened thus far, including the fake ceremony. Bree is confident that even her parents are ignorant to everything the Order has told them. In the video entitled Hi Gemma, Bree finally acknowledges Gemma's response videos. Bree confirms that the two did have a history together and that Gemma is indeed part of a communal sect of the Order based in London. Gemma then responds where she takes a soft critical approach to Bree's choice to not go through with the ceremony. Bree, I don't think you're taking this seriously enough. It doesn't matter if you've made the decision not to be in the ceremony. It's not your decision to make. They are in charge. To be honest, it hasn't been easy for me to be here. Even though I wasn't picked for the ceremony like you were, it's still difficult for me to be independent. I've known since I was a little girl that one day I would leave. I've always had misgivings about that place. Look, I understand it's hard to know who to trust. I know that. It's your decision. I just hope you'll listen to some of the things I'm saying. Next we find Bree in quite an upbeat mood. She has talked things over with her parents, and they seem to be understanding. According to Bree, her parents shared their own misgivings about what exactly was going on and that they would have a few words with some of their elder deacons. Her father even seemed to be softening to the idea of Daniel being allowed back into the house. A few days later, Bree responds to Gemma's criticism. So, this is for Gemma. I know that you're trying to help, and I completely understand, but... I've trusted my parents my whole life, and if anything, what's happened lately has just made me trust them even more. It was very hard for me to tell my parents that I didn't want to go through with the ceremony, and I'm sure that it was even harder for them to admit that they were wrong, but they did. They also admitted that they shouldn't have been so blindly trusting of our deacons. My dad even said that he should have asked more questions about the shots that he was giving me. Most importantly, they reminded me that they loved me and they did everything because they wanted what was best for me. And if a person can admit that they were wrong and apologize, I'll forgive them. Bree, I saw your latest uh, video and I'm concerned. Let me explain. There was a girl like your age now. I must have been... I must have been eight when it, when it happened and she was like you. Uh, chosen to do the ceremony at a young age. I remember the preparations. She too received injections and went on this strange diet. Her family left the commune after the ceremony. The weird thing is they left all their furniture in their house and like pictures of their family on the wall. I suppose they were in a hurry. Even their dog Sasha was left behind. We got letters from them over the years but their tone was very different. They were always so likable, very friendly and warm. But their letters, it's almost as though it was a different family altogether. I knew something wasn't quite right. I really didn't know what happened. It was, it was strange. So what are we to make of Gemma's response here? Is this a true story of a family within the communal setting of the order that somehow disappeared? Is Gemma truly concerned about Bree or is this a deceptively veiled threat? What are we to make of Gemma herself? A short time later we learn that Bree's parents have spoken to some of the deacons and that it didn't go very well. An argument seemed to break out and that the deacons ordered that Bree must go through with the ordeal. 
The experience left Bree's parents fearful, but Bree refuses to submit and reiterates that she will not go through with the ceremony. Needing to clear her head, she decides to spend a few days at Daniel's. While staying at Daniel's, Bree seems concerned that after calling her house, her mother told her that she should stay with Daniel for an indeterminate amount of time until they say it's okay for her to come home. Later, after trying to contact them a second time, Bree seems disturbed that no one is answering the phone. Bree and Daniel then decide to check things out. Put this really quick and I hey, guess. Bri, you gotta go. Okay, bye. I've been calling my parents all day. They don't pick up and they haven't called me back. I hope that. They checked into a hotel or something. What are they doing? Where are they going? I don't know. Hold on. Who is that guy? I don't know. I, I saw him at the ceremony. I think he's a deacon. We saw the car leave with her parents, we went inside. We went upstairs to her room, and her parents had hidden a note inside Purple Monkey. They had left her some money in there too. We're still very upset. She starts crying every couple hours. The note said that she should stay with me. And we didn't feel it was gonna be safe at my house, so we've been driving around more. As we come to the close of this part one, the series reaches what can almost unanimously be agreed upon by fans as the series' most significant turning point. Lonely Girl 15 will go from a documented telling of a seemingly ordinary girl dealing with extraordinary circumstances in the comfortable suburbs of California, to an on-the-road thriller that will have twists, turns, and plenty of mayhem. Don't go anywhere as this unique story is just getting heated up. In part two, we'll see the introduction of quirky and exciting new characters, monumental new revelations, romantic drama, and all within the encompassing shadow of the all-powerful organization that we've come to know as The Order. Stay tuned.